there's, there's light that is dawning in the darkness. And each, each week that we light a new candle, that, that light grows brighter. Until on, on the day of Christmas Eve, when we gather here to worship, we'll light the, the Christ candle. The recognition that everything truly has changed. And that we get to step into the place of God's grace and beauty and splendor each and every day and be eclipsed. Our hearts are eclipsed by the goodness and glory of God. And so as we gather today, we're going to light the first candle. And, and I pray that for me, it's, it's, it's the candle of expectation. expectation. It's the candle of anticipation. What if we entered into Advent this season expecting to God to do something that, that we've never experienced in our lives before? What if we truly believe that this God is big and mighty and majestic, full of splendor and beauty, and that no matter where I am and what I'm going through and what I'm enduring right now, what if we came expecting God to, to do something that leaves us dumbstruck and filled with awe? Maybe that's our hopes this season. So today we light the candle of anticipation and expectation that the one who has come as a child in a manger would come fresh upon our lives in these coming weeks in brand new ways in each one of our lives. Let us pray. Father, today we celebrate you. As a preacher, there's this this odd tension I live in, Lord, to have to somehow speak of things that I, I really can't speak of. Glory, majesty, splendor, beauty. We have words, but those words fall short. Those words can't capture the fullness of who you are. So, Lord, we need you to reveal yourself to each of us. That may be one of the, the greatest mysteries of, of this, whole, this whole thing, that you being the God of the cosmos, you being the God who numbers the stars and boundaries the oceans, would come and be a God who is with each and every one of us. And I'm praying that today, Lord, in some way, somehow, some, some means, you in a fresh way demonstrate your love for us. Remind us of who you are. That our hearts, our minds, our very lives are turned towards you. We're caught up in the beauty and the splendor of your majesty. That your holiness would pervade every part of our being. That we might live as the transformed people of God. No longer the same. Made different. Not by what we do, but by what you do in us. And we'll be certain to, to give you glory as you do what only you can. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. So there he, there he stood in what would have been the equivalent of maybe like a burlap sack. And in the recent days, he had feasted on a peculiar diet of wild honey and locusts. That sounds good, right? There was a certain eccentricity about him, something a bit uh, peculiar, something stunningly captivating about his life, but I'm not certain that that's why people flocked, flocked to him. Crowds came out in droves out to the desert to somehow, some way, get within earshot of this crazed, outspoken truth teller. That, that's what we would call him, a truth teller, or, or, or maybe the biblical word who speaks the will of God into the world, who calls people into account for their actions, their attitudes, and the very postures of their hearts towards God. And there in the desert, he did just that. He, he would call the religious purists a brood of vipers. He would challenge them, those, those self-righteous religious people to repent of their of their religiosity and and everybody would celebrate but here's the thing about this guy his call to repentance was evenly distributed the call to repentance the call to turn the call to change 
was to be worked out in everybody's life, in whatever sphere of life they found themselves, and was to bear out in a life that was fully yielded to God and one that treated others justly and with love. And there in the desert, he, he baptized people into this repentance, into this, this change of life. And as, and as people flocked, there was a certain curiosity that began to emerge. Who might this man be? Is, is he the one that we've been waiting for? Is, is he the one that we've been looking for? Because these people that were coming out to the desert, they were looking for something. We're, we're always looking for something, aren't we? Something that we believe has promise. Something that we can get our hands, our hearts, our heads around. Something that is stable and secure. Something that we can trust. Something that we can put our hopes in finally that won't let us down. And so in our search for something, we flit about from thing to thing thinking this is it. I can trust this. This I can put my hopes in. And we do, and then it fails us. And so we run off, and we're looking for something else. The people were looking for something. They had come out from the cities to the desert looking for something. And they thought, is John the baptizer, is, is, he, is he the one that we're looking for? And then they get out to the desert, and they hear something odd. The one they came out to look to looks to them and says, look over there. Don't look at me. Look over. In fact, the gospel, according to John, writes it this way. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look. He says, behold, pay attention, direct your gaze there, he says, for that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one that I meant, he said, when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to all of Israel. See, John had been trying to tell them for some time now that I'm not the one that you're looking for. I simply came to prepare the way for the one that you were looking for. He was simply telling them to ready themselves for the one who was coming. But John knew about them and about us. What we hate to admit is that we don't always know what it is that we're looking for. And when you don't know what you're looking for, but you're always looking for something, there's a tendency to fall prey to anything and everything. Have you ever noticed that? When you don't know what it is that you're looking for, what's going to give you stability, security, fullness in your life, you, you run about and, and you're going to fall prey to anything and everything. They, they've been looking. They, they look to their religion and their religious leaders. Maybe, maybe that will do it only to feel excluded and left out and let down by those religious leaders. They, they, they look to their politics. Can you imagine that as their hope? I know that's so weird, right? They just thought if they had the right politics, if they had the right bit of military conquest, that that would do it. They, they've been looking to the health of their economy. If we could just straighten things out in our finances, we'd be fine. They'd been looking to some sort of domestic or foreign policy that would alleviate them from their suffering. They were looking for someone to come and relieve the stress that they were enduring under some sort of tax relief for tax reform. They were looking for something. They were looking for a quick fix. Something that in their episode of the larger story of humanity would promise to get them out of the predicament that they currently found themselves in. And, and, and when you're just looking for something, desperation can you have you looking anywhere and everywhere. And have you fallen prey to any thing. And John the baptizer knew knew of that desperation. 
And he knew that if he wasn't clear in telling them what they were looking for, that hope might pass them by and they might miss it altogether. So John the baptizer knew he had to point it out. He had, he had to tell them what it is that they were looking for. So he says, that, that's him. I, I know you've come out looking for something, but that's, that's him. That's the Lamb of God. That's the one who has the power to transform. That, that, that's, that's the one who won't allow us to languish in the squalor, squalor of our captivity and bondage to our sinfulness and our rebellion and the despair that we found ourselves so often wrapped up in. He said, that's, that's who you're looking for. That's him. That's, that's the thing that you're looking, looking for. Turn your eyes to him. He says, behold, look over there. But in order for us to see what John the baptizer is pointing to, we have to be willing to turn our eyes up and away from the other myriad of things that we've been looking at. That's tough, isn't it? Because how much of our lives has been spent looking at those wrong things? And sure, we come on a Sunday morning and we tip our hat to God and say, God, I'm going to spend about half an hour looking to you, but then the rest of the week I'm looking around. But the Gospel of John teaches us something else. Not only does John the baptizer say, look over there, look, look to Jesus, because that's the one you're looking for. John, the writer of the gospel, those are two different Johns. John, the writer of the gospel says, okay, but if you're going to look at Jesus, make sure you know exactly what you're, what you're looking at when you look at Jesus. Because we don't want you to treat Jesus as just some sort of quick fix, just another episode in the story of humanity. He said, do you know what it is that you're looking at when your head spin, when you behold, when you pay attention, when you look to Jesus, do you know what it is that you're looking at? And so John, the gospel writer, begins to tell us right from the beginning who it was that we were looking at when we looked to Jesus. He says these words. In the beginning, he identifies Jesus with the word of God, the wisdom of God made manifest in this world. He said, in the beginning was the word Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he said. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then he goes, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, the baptizer, who came as a witness to testify concerning to that light, that, that though through him all might believe, he says. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He, this is powerful, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, they didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own. But they were so busy looking down and around and at other things that they didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The word, God himself becomes flesh. He makes his dwelling amongst us. And we've seen this glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. See, John, the gospel writer, knows something very important. That as John the baptizer points and says, look, behold, Jesus is the one you're looking for. John, the gospel writer, wants to say to us, make sure you don't misinterpret who this Jesus is that comes to you. He says, don't turn Jesus into some super spiritual guru away among other ways in this world where if you listen to him, he'll say some really important spiritual stuff to make you feel better about your life. Make sure you don't turn Jesus into that. 
He says, make sure that you don't turn Jesus into just some political hope or aspiration, believing that if he was just in charge of our government and he could legislate our beliefs, that all would be made well. Don't do that to him. He says, make sure you don't turn Jesus into just some high ideal or worldview or important philosophy in the world. He said, make sure you don't turn Jesus into just some good, strong, moral example that if you could just do exactly like he does, everything will work. Make sure you don't do that with him. Make sure you don't see him just as a quick fix to your woes. See, the gospel of the the John, the writer of the gospel of John won't let that happen. Because in order for him to explain to us who Jesus is, he goes backward. He goes backward way past the moment where John the baptizer said, look, behold, he goes back to before there was a before. He goes back to the moment that, that was before all time. And he, he says that there, Jesus, the wisdom of God, the word of God was present in God, with God, through God, because he was God. And anything that has come into existence in this world, anything that is, has come through him, he says. This Jesus that John the baptizer is pointing to, this is not just any man, not just any person in a long string of history's episodes that promised help and hope for the time being. This is the author of all creation, he says. There is nothing that would be or that has come to be except that it has come through him. It is through him, he says, all things have their being. And we can see this, John says, because we can go all the way back to the creation story. That as you take this journey all the way back to the creation story, as God is creating in His majesty, splendor, beauty, and glory, it is through the word that God speaks, let it be. And it's through the word that God speaks, let it be, and it is. And it's good because it is the word. It's the word of God, the wisdom of God put on display for all to see. It is the word of God that has the capacity to create all things out of nothing. He says, this author of existence, when he creates he doesn't create just simple, simply as an act of power, as though God is flexing his muscles and saying, look what I can do. No, when God creates, he is spilling out his divine holy love into the world, and he's shaping and forming something beautiful and majestic and glorious, something that bears his, his divine glory. He says, this one that you looked to, This one that you're paying attention to. He's the author of all existence. In fact, it says that the way this world was was to work was that in the midst of the majestic splendor and glory and, dare I say, holiness of God, that on day six, on this beautiful day, God looks upon creation and puts his stamp on creation through the creation of humanity. And he says, humans, you, I, we, us... We are to be the image bearers of that God in this world. That humanity is to bear the image and the likeness of God. That humanity is to reflect, radiate, and represent the glory, beauty, and holiness of God in this world. That the one that you're looking to is the author of your creation and knows what your purpose is because he designed it. The whole world would, would have it displayed The beauty of God. For God's holy purpose was this, that those things that had been created in Him and through Him and for the world would reflect this holy God in all of creation. And the Bible tells us that as long as creation looks to its Creator, as long as the characters of the story look to the author's intent, As long as the image bearers of God bask in the light, in the life, in the glory, and the grace of God, all would be well. As long as we, as God's created, 
we turn our gaze and fix our gaze, all will be well. But that's where the story takes a tragic turn. Because we just, we just aren't very good at looking where we ought to look. And, and the moment that we take our eyes off, the moment we shift our perspective, everything comes unraveled. Not that any of us have ever been there, right? The moment where we took our eyes off, it's the story of the garden. They're in the garden. Adam and Eve are living in the beauty and the splendor. They're radiating the image of God, reflecting it in all of creation. They're looking to the creator and all is well. And then something out of the corner of their eye catches their eye and they're like... Just a moment. That, that fruit looks good. Pleasing to the eye. And desirable for gaining what we want. There's a shift in our gaze. And that becomes the plague of humanity from that point on, from the moment that we take our eyes off of God and we place it on other things where our gaze is stolen, where our view is obstructed, and our eyes then are turned downward. And, from, and, and, it's, and for some reason, instead of looking to the origin and the source of everything that has its being, instead of looking to the Creator... We start looking at the created. Instead of, instead of fixing our eyes on the author, we look to the page of the story and the things that we create and put on those pages. And that evidence is found throughout the story of God. It's found in the story of our lives as we again, time and time again, put our trust in the idols of our own making in our own power, in our own capacity, in our own longings for gods who will do our bidding. That, that's why we turn our eyes. Because if I take my eyes off the Creator and put it on the created, I can make the created do whatever I want it to do. And there's something that happens, something that is significantly lost in that moment. That's why John the baptizer has to come and say, look, because we're not looking anymore in the right places. In fact, one of the writers in the New Testament writes to a church in the, in the city of Rome, and he says these words, it's how bad things got, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And get this. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a moral, mortal human being or as birds or animals or reptiles. Did you hear that word exchanged? They exchanged the glory, majesty, beauty, and holiness of God for stuff. Things made to look like reptiles. And you're like, that's weird. Because we would never, we would never exchange and put our Eyes on things we make, like our bank accounts. We would never turn our eyes to our politics. We would never put our eyes on our, our bottles that make us feel better. We would never turn our eyes to that relationship on the side, that what we thought we were looking for. We would never exchange so much for so little. And yet we do. And the more that we look away from the creator and look to the created, we abandon our high calling of being the image bearers of God. Did you know that's your high calling? We abandon that calling and we plummet into our own rebelliousness and brokenness. But you know what I love about God? He's not content for that exchange. God doesn't share nicely our gaze. And so throughout the whole of human history, 
God has been working to captivate the hearts and the minds and the eyes and the vision of humanity again. God has been at work trying to get us to turn our eyes away from this stuff and reflect back to the glory and the majesty and the splendor and the holiness of God. And throughout the story of God, God shows up in these magnificent ways, in these ways in which seas parts and cities are toppled, in these ways where nothing could have happened if God had not come through. And in the midst of that awe and that splendor, everybody's eyes are like, whoa, that was amazing. God, you're full of majesty and splendor. We celebrate. But give them a minute. All right, that was awesome. I'm going to look back over here. Not that we would ever do that. Not that God would ever show up in our lives in some extraordinary and beautiful and faithful way. And for a moment, but a moment later, looking at all the wrong things again. And then God sends people over and over again throughout the story of God to remind them. He, he says, hey, listen, like, like he says through Moses, he says, who is like you among the gods, O Lord, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. He says, who is like you? Why do we stare at this stuff when we begin to be looking to you, the author of our existence? Hannah in a prayer she prays in 1 Samuel says, There's no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, no one besides you. Nor is there any rock. I love that. Nor is there any rock like our God. Nothing is stable, secure, and sound as our God. But over and over again, in our desperate attempt to look for something, we fall prey to anything and everything. And then John the baptizer shows up and he says, look. And the writer of the gospel of John says, yes. And if you're going to look at Jesus, make sure you know what it is that you're looking to. Because you're not just looking to any man for help. You are looking for the light of the world that has dawned into all of creation. You aren't looking to just some sort of great moral example. You're looking for the author of righteousness. You're looking to the one who's so unrelentingly committed to captivating our attention that he opts for direct intervention. He opts to descend from upon high and come down low. He opts to show up and dawn the flesh of humanity. The glory of God would fill up a human body and walk around. And this isn't just some sort of episode, a momentary fix in the story of humanity. This is the holy purpose of God. The holy purpose of a God that loves so supremely and thoroughly that he's willing to collapse the space between heaven and earth and take up residence in our neighborhood that's the beauty of the story of God that Jesus is God's going all the way to return our hearts and our, our eyes to our gaze upon him and even in those moments when he's not recognized there is someone pointing at and saying look, look to him in this moment, take this chance to look. Turn your face to the one who had dreamt your face even before it was a face. Turn your hearts over to the one who had authored every beat of your heart. You'll see, John says, that the one who has come into the world is the light of the world who is so full of light that a body can't contain that light, but that light pours out into the darkness. He says, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Because the one who has come, he's come as word, he's come as the wisdom of God to direct our lives and our attention back to our original created intent. You and I have been created purposefully to reflect and bear image to the grace of God and the word of God calls us back to that. He says he's come as light whose beauty and splendor reveals the darkness that so often plagues our lives. He comes as life whose presence transforms that which is broken and corrupt and decaying and fills it with the capacity to live abundantly, fully, and holy forever. He comes as love 
who captures our hearts through the self-giving sacrifice of a God who goes to whatever lengths necessary to reveal himself to us. He comes to us as grace. That no matter the kind of brokenness and sinfulness that we've allowed our lives to be captured and captivated by, he says, if you just receive me, if you just open up your heart for a moment and let me in, I will give you opportunity to be called child of God. He comes as truth. The one who puts on display who God truly is, but also revealing to us what we were created to be, image bearers of God. And so John the baptizer says, wait, don't look there. Look, behold, look and don't stop looking, he says. Don't allow your eyes to become fixed on anything else because the moment that you allow your eyes and your hearts to turn towards anything else, you abandon so much and you get so little and you plummet so far. He says, look. Look to Jesus, not as a momentary fix, but as the one who was before all things and the one who is who is through all things, and the one who will be at the end of all things. He says, look as the one who holds the whole of human history together. Look to him, he says. And then they go on to clarify throughout the New Testament who it is that we're looking to. And there's this beautiful passage that says, if you're looking to Jesus, this is what you're looking to. And it's written to a church in the city of Colossae. And it says these words, and these are some of my favorite words in all of the scriptures. The Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell within him, and through him to reconcile unto himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, making peace by his blood shed on the cross. Paul says, when you turn your head and you and you look to what John is pointing at, you're looking to the Alpha and the Omega. You're looking to the beginning and the end. You're looking to everything that, that is in between. You're looking at the thread that holds together our entire story. And then another writer says these words, let us throw everything that hinders off the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out. Get this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so you'll not grow weary and lose heart. Look, but don't stop looking. And the last church... I was privileged in my church to have dozens of men and women who were in their 60s and 70s, 80s, and even early 90s. These men and women were some of the godliest saints that I'd ever been around in my life. And I made, my, made up my mind that as a 33-year-old green, you know, still wet behind the ears preacher, that I was going to spend as much time as I could around them. So I just got close to them. Because there was something about their lives that were so compelling. And there was something, because I knew their stories, and I knew the hardships that they endured, and I knew the losses that they had suffered, and I knew the broken moments that they'd gone through, and I'd heard their stories, and I kept asking them, like, what, what is it about your love? Why, why do you keep steadfast in the way that, that you are? And they say, Jeff, you make it too difficult. And I say, what do you mean? And they said, you just gotta, you just gotta turn your eyes to Jesus. I'd say, what do you mean? And they'd say, you just got to look to Jesus. I, I, okay. No, Jeff, stop looking at the other stuff. You just fix your eyes, fix your gaze. 
And I watched as these men and women, these who'd faithfully wandered this journey for 60 and 70 and 80 years, model for me what a life of consistent, steady, fixed days looked like. That you could throw anything around them, but they wouldn't be drawn off course. They weren't going to look to other stuff because they had become so accustomed to turning their eyes to Jesus. And then on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, we'd gather. And when we'd gather, one of the things that we did was we had uh, hymns by request. So we would sit there and we had some really great pianists. And so they would just throw out, hey, what, what hymn do you want to sing? And they would sing, they would name hymns. And then one would come up often. It's one that I've, I've grown to appreciate deeply. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. O'er us in no more half dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Sing it with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, He promised. Believe Him and all will be Then go to a world that is dying, His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. They requested those songs a lot. Sometimes I wonder if it was just simply to remind their pastor that that's where his eyes should be. But I watched it modeled in their lives. And here's... Here's what happens. When we make that a consistent practice of our lives, something happens. Because that gaze that we turn towards Jesus is so that. This is where I want to end with us today. Because going into Advent, you need to hear this. That the gaze that we, that we, that we turn our eyes and fix them on Jesus is so that you and I can recover God's created intent for our lives. See, if Jesus is not just an episode in the story of humanity, then we are not just simply moments in that episode, but our lives somehow, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, are caught up in the grand design, the grand plan, the grand intent of God for all of creation, that somehow, when we turn our eyes away from the created and to the creator, from the pages to the author, our lives are caught up 
restored, reclaimed, redeemed, and somehow, get this, the image of God is beginning to be reflected in us again. Did you know that as we turn our eyes to Jesus, transformation takes place in our lives? That we are no longer who we once were. That somehow as I fix my... That's why I was drawn to those men and women at that church. Because there was something beautiful about their lives. That when I got around them, I could just feel the glory and holiness and beauty of God spilling out from around them. Because they were so accustomed to fixing their eyes on the author and perfecter of their faith. The Alpha and Omega. The one who for the glory of God scorned the shame of the cross. Who came and died on our behalf. Was raised to new life. Who came as the one who bore out the grace and truth of God. That they become so captivated by him that their lives were transformed and they begin to reflect this image of God in the world can you imagine that if we together corporately turned our eyes every single day and every moment of the day and we stopped looking to the other stuff how that glory that beauty might be reflected through us not that we receive any praise for that but the praise goes through us to the one whose image it is that we're reflecting because the glory of God is on display, not the glory of man. But in that, there's something beautiful that you, your life, can be caught up in the grand design of God. You matter. You matter because when you were born, you were stamped with the imprint of the image of the immortal God. And we don't exchange that for anything but by turning our eyes. We step back into that high calling, that high calling of transformation, that high calling of holiness, that high calling of wholeness where our lives are put back together. We allow ourselves to be transformed. We submit and surrender our hearts to the one who makes the way. So my question is very simply, have you, have you turned your eyes to Jesus? Or have you, have you turned your eyes at one time, you saw the goodness that he was, but then you got drawn off course and you've been looking to a lot of other stuff recently. H have you looked to the author or are you still fixated on the pages? H have you looked to the one who holds us in his hands and says, every breath, every heartbeat, everything that you are is dependent upon me. And that if you yield yourself to me, I will transform you so thoroughly that your life will be revolutionized and changed. I want to invite my worship team to come out. And I want to give you a moment to just reflect upon that. I want you to ask the question, do I know the true story? If I let my life be caught up into the true story of God's holy purpose in this world. And at the end of this, Song, I'm going to offer you an opportunity if you've yet to turn to the author. If you've yet to allow God to grab hold of your attention, captivate your gaze, that today you're going to have an opportunity to, to look, behold, the Lamb of God who was and is and will be the author of everything that will be. Would you stand with us? Let's sing and I want to reflect upon that and then I'll come up give you an opportunity to pray in just a moment.